What is up guys, this is Luke Hill for Kit Guru, and in this one we're looking at NZXT's new B550 motherboard, the N7 B550. So this is a fundamentally based on an ASRock design motherboard, roughly the B550 Steel Legend, but it has some of that NZXT flair, as you can see from this quite attractive white covering. And don't worry, there is a black version if you prefer matte black everything. Clearly, aesthetics are one of the key design criteria for the N7 B550, but you do get some really good hardware too. So most notably, Wi-Fi 6E connectivity, and you get some special NZXT features, which would be particularly useful if you're already in the ecosystem. So stay tuned to see what this 210 pound motherboard brings to the market. Before we get into the main review section though, if you like what we do here at Kikuru, make sure you hit the like and subscribe button. That really helps us grow the YouTube channel and that really helps us out. Make sure you check out the written review on the Kikuru website. That also supports us really, really well. And if you want to support us even more, check out our social media channels and buy a cool t-shirt like this one. Let's get back into it. If we start off by looking at the aesthetics of the NZXT N7 B550, you can see that it's just absolutely glorious in terms of styling. Usually I'll refrain from giving an opinion or a hard opinion in terms of looks, but this is just a fantastic looking motherboard in my opinion. The black and white contrast works superbly well and this cover feels really premium. It feels metal, it is a little bit plasticky in parts, but you can't see any drops in quality and structurally it's actually pretty sound. And one point I will say is that I quite like these perforated dot styling features. I guess they're intended to signal where the heat sinks are. They don't really do all that much fundamentally, but they do look pretty cool in my opinion. One notable exception though is any form of onboard RGB lighting. And that's really quite surprising given that it's just the norm for 210 pound motherboards in today's market. And then I guess the other aesthetic point to note, which is also functionally quite useful, is with regards to the connectors. They're all placed around the edge of the motherboard. We get quite a lot of right angled connectors. So clearly NZXT has put a big, big emphasis on clean cable management and they deserve credit here. But let's dig a little bit deeper with a closer look at the motherboard. If we come around to the top edge connectors, you can see an eight plus four pin for power to the CPU. That's good to see. Probably not gonna saturate eight pin, but it does give you a little bit of redundancy and backup. You've got a top edge fan connector, which is one for the CPU and one for an AIO pump. Now I typically don't like one for the CPU, but NZXT gets away with this because you've got two more four pin system fan headers right on this top edge. So you do have access to four four pin connectors. And then also up here where you'd usually find a three pin and a four pin RGB connection, you actually get NZXT's proprietary RGB connection. So you get two of those if you want to integrate the motherboard with your NZXT ecosystem partner in hardware. Good to see. Obviously a vertically orientated 24 pin connector. And next to this, we get an internal type C header. And this does run at 10 gigabits per second, USB 3.2 gen two. Jumping around to the SATA area, we can see six right angled SATA six gigabits per second connections. All of these six gigabits per second connections run from the B550 chipset. Next to this, we also have two internal five gigabits per second USB three headers. Two right angle connectors is good for cable management, but it's not very good for redundancy because if your case interferes with one of them, it's gonna interfere with two of them, leaving you with no front panel USB. Jumping along to the bottom edge connectors, star of the show is clearly the triple USB two internal headers. That is absolutely fantastic. Big credit to NZXT there. I don't know why competing vendors don't go for this because it's such an easy implementation. You do also get standard RGB headers down here. So you get a three pin and also a four pin 12 volt. So that's good if you have non NZXT RGB components in your build. And then you get three more four pin fan headers positioned down the bottom of the motherboard. This takes the total up to seven for the entire board, which is a really impressive number. And they do run at two amp current output if you wanna run an all-in-one pump, for example, or splitters. Very, very good for the fan connectivity options. And then the other point that I'm really happy with along this bottom edge is the onboard power and reset buttons. Really good to see, excellent for troubleshooting. And we also get four debug LEDs. If 
If we now focus on the expansion slots, the top full length steel reinforced one is PCIe Gen 4 by 16. The secondary full length slot actually runs a PCIe Gen 3 by 4 from the chipset. And then the other two connectors are PCIe Gen 3 by 1 links from the B550 chipset. Now in terms of M.2 connectivity, this starts off pretty good with the N7 B550. And the reason that I say that is because NZXT has had a little bit of innovation here that I quite like. So underneath these metal magnetic covers, where you'll find the M.2 slots. Initially, I'll be perfectly honest, I thought these were going to be very gimmicky, I thought they weren't going to work, they weren't going to be secure, but they do have clips in them that you can position into place and then the magnetic section actually clips down really pretty easily and with solid strength. Can't really complain about that. Where I will complain, however, is the fact that there's no heat sink built into these metal covers, so functionally they're pretty useless when it comes to putting an SSD beneath. And that's because a modern SSD, especially a Gen 4 high-speed one, is just going to thermal throttle. And that's made even worse by the fact that you can't really fit an M.2 SSD with a heatsink underneath the magnetic covers. So even the modestly sized WD Black SN750 and its small heatsink doesn't fit under there properly and flush. Therefore, if you want proper M.2 cooling, as we would strongly advise, you can have to ditch these innovative covers, which no doubt add some cost to the motherboard, which is pretty disappointing. I'm not entirely sure why NZXT didn't add a thermal pad on there, so you could at least deploy some of the heat out to this metal cover. Not a very good implementation in actual practice. And then we have to be perfectly honest in saying that the M.2 situation actually gets worse from this point onwards. It starts off with the top slot running at PCIe Gen 4x4 from a Ryzen 5000 CPU. That's absolutely fine. No problems with bandwidth there. However, the bottom slot runs at either SATA 6 gigabits per second or PCIe Gen 3 by 2 link speed. And it steals those lanes from the B550 chipset and actually shares them with two of the SATA ports. So not only do you lose some of your SATA connectivity when using an SSD in this slot, a proper SSD is actually going to be crippled at roughly half the speed because of the by 2 link. This is a really, really bad design decision and ASRock is the blame here because the underlying ASRock motherboard that NZXT has used has this really quite silly design choice. However, NZXT should have insisted and mandated that this was improved. Of course, you can get around this by putting an M.2 SSD in an adapter card and then using the bottom full-length PCIe slot, but you shouldn't have to make this ugly and annoying compromise. If we jump around to the rear I.O., then this is an area where NZXT does well. Starting off, you can see a 2.5 gigabit network connection for wired internet, of course, and that's from a Realtek RTL 8125 controller, so not the somewhat troublesome Intel 2.5 gig NIC. You also get Wi-Fi 6E connectivity from an Intel 210 adapter, and this is new and higher speed because it uses a different frequency channel to Wi-Fi 6, so it is an improvement, but of course you'll need a Wi-Fi 6E router to benefit from that. You get nine USB Type-A ports, which is a ludicrous number, but we have absolutely no complaints. Two USB 2 for peripherals, you get four five gigabits per second USB, and then you get another three 10 gigabits per second USB 3.2 Gen 2, and then added to those nine Type A ports is a single 10 gigabits per second Type C port. NZXT has clearly gone big on 10 gigabits per second USB 3.2 Gen 2 connectivity, as proven by the four rear mounted ports plus the one internal Type C header. It's great to see a BIOS flashback button, and then my favorite, the clear CMOS button on the rear IO, is still there great for troubleshooting and messing around when overclocking. In terms of video output, we get a single HDMI 2.1 and then the audio is driven by a Realtek ALC1220 codec with a TINE5532 op amp. Focusing on the power delivery solution, the N7 B550 is built around a six layer PCB. The VRM is a 12 plus two stage design which is managed by a Renezas 229004 PWM controller operating in six plus two mode. So you do get doublers. You've got 12 Vichy SIC654 Dr. Moss power stages for the CPU itself. These are split as 10 to the left side and two to the top left side. So that's pretty good from a heatsink perspective and the 50 amp Dr. Moss power stages. These are driven by Intel ISL6617A PWM phase doublers on the rear of the motherboard. So basically this is a 12 stage six phase control solution. 
Now we need to make a point there because NZXT's reviewer's guide is actually incorrect as proven by our visual examination of this motherboard. They list 12 true phases for the CPU vCore, which as we've proven is not correct. And they also list SIC632A power stages for the CPU vCore, which again we've proven is not correct. So just watch out for that information if you do see it highlighted on any other publications or any other YouTube channels. You then get two stages for the SOC, and they are Vichy SIC632A Dr. Moss power stages. And rounding things out are 12K rated Nichicon capacitors, and the memory is a two-phase solution. So overall, we'd say this is a solid power delivery solution, which is pretty representative of a 210 pound motherboard. Looking now at the VRM heatsink, this is fundamentally just a lump of metal with some fancy aesthetics. So clearly, as we typically see, this is basically a looks first, function second design, though there is some degree of effort to make fins and increase the surface area. Quite frankly, being such a big lump of metal, this is probably gonna do a pretty stellar job at cooling the power stages, especially because the VRM is a pretty efficient design. And I must say, it does look really good in my opinion. The UEFI for NZXT's N7B550 is standard ASRock with basically an NZXT skin applied. So it comes with all the pros and cons of ASRock's typical UEFI. One notable exception, however, is the complete omission of an easy mode, which I typically like to see. So not quite sure why NZXT didn't have this included, as it would have been a good feature for more novice users. The settings are functional and navigation is easy, as we always see from ASRock UEFIs. CPU vCore, for example, hits red to tell a user the level is high at 1.45 volts, and load line calibration guidance is visually good. Fan control needs work, though, as is usual from ASRock, and this is disappointing given that it is one of NZXT's biggest focused points for this motherboard. You don't get any hysteresis control, and there's no graphical option in the UEFI. Plus, you also get limited temperature sensor data fed through to headers, and that fan tuning cycle does something i don't quite know what it really does it turned the pump down to 20 percent for example which is odd and not good so i wouldn't put too much faith in what it is actually doing of course if you're really particular with regards to fan control that's where you should probably be using nzxt's cam software in the operating system provided you're happy to install operating system software the same goes for RGB control, which is completely omitted from the UEFI, somewhat disappointingly, although this is quite common with motherboard vendors. Back on the positives though, you get 10 save profiles, which is an excellent number and gives you plenty of flexibility. And the SSD arrays and sanitization tools are really good inclusions. Instant flash for the BIOS is also good. It does scan through your USB drive, so if you've got lots of stuff on there, it could take a while, but it's an easy, somewhat automated tool. So overall, pretty solid UEFI, as we typically see from ASRock, but not up there in the higher tiers when it comes to fan speed control, for example. Let's have a look at NZXT cam support for the N7B550. Now, of course, for lighting, the N7B550 doesn't have onboard lighting, but our Kraken Z63 liquid cooler does, so you can control that here. And then what we're interested in is overclocking. So you can mess around with overclocking through the OS software. Not sure if I would necessarily do this myself, but some people may prefer it. And then importantly, we've got cooling. So you can see each of the fan speeds and the information related to temperatures and the RPMs in cam. And then if I go in, I'm just gonna try and manage some of the fans. So basically I've got a pump which is actually the pump and then the cpu fan is running at 1600 rpm and this is not actually the cpu fan i've just got something else connected to it so let's see if i can just turn that down to silent yes and that changes in real time and i can actually hear the difference which is really good and the other good thing is that it only shows the headers with fans actually connected so if i turn them all now to performance mode i should see the numbers change and i should hear numbers change indeed so this is pretty good motherboard fan software as far as I'm concerned. It's actually very, very good by comparison to the competing vendor's solution. So credit to NZXT there. Cam really is a good ecosystem at this point. Our test system is built around the Ryzen 9 5950X processor. We use 32 gigabytes of Corsair Vengeance LPX DDR4 memory at 3600 C16. Our CPU cooler is an Acer Tech 280 millimeter all-in-one liquid cooling unit. Graphics comes from the Gigabyte RTX 3080 Eagle OC, and clean power is fed by a Seasonic 1kW TX1000 power supply. 
For the SSDs, we use a couple of WD Black SSDs. So one is a Gen 3x4 SN750, and then we use a Gen 4x4 SN850. We use the latest BIOS at the time of testing, which is P1.20, and this has the latest AMD AGISA profile, which is 1.2.0.0. Make sure you check out the Kikaroo page for more details on the test system, the procedure, and just more information in general that we can squeeze into the written review. If you've got any questions, check over there first, but make sure you ask down below as well. I'll be more than happy to help out if I can. Let's jump on into the testing. NZXT Zen 7 B550 makes a bit of a slow start in terms of performance and continues to lag throughout, despite running with the same physical hardware as the competitors. This is because NZXT's default BIOS mode when we enable XMP only puts the fabric clock up to 1600 MHz as opposed to the usual and intended 1800 MHz with our 3600 MHz DDR4 kit. The result is a consistent loss in performance. Manual checks confirm that much of the performance is regained when applying 1800 MHz F clock manually, but not all of the gap to the compressors is closed. Frankly, this is not good enough. Setting the correct fabric clock for use with XMP memory is a basic task, so this is how we have tested. If the motherboard vendor cannot get this correct, we are not going to give them the benefit of the doubt by manually tuning up to higher settings. We'll save that for our overclock tests. Performance from the M.2 slots is as disappointing as we would expect given the underlying ASRock board's poor design choices and NZXT's lack of cooling heat sinks. Yes, the Gen 4 slot runs our WD Black SN850 at full speed initially, but it doesn't take long to observe severe thermal throttling and performance drop off due to the 90C plus running temperatures. At this point, your 5 gigabyte per second SSD can quickly drop to sub 500 megabytes per second on writes. Plus, the speeds from the Gen 3 by 2 slot at the bottom are undeniably frustrating at sub 2 gigabytes per second on our 3.5 gigabyte per second capable SSD. The NZXT and ASRock M.2 solution is very poor for a £210 motherboard. Thankfully, the audio solution scores well in Rightmark Audio Analyzer thanks to the use of Realtek's quality ALC1220 codec. Unfortunately, we cannot test 10 gigabits per second speeds due to the ongoing AMD platform USB issues, and we do not have access to a Wi Fi 6E router either but plenty of 10 gigabits per second USB and high-speed Wi-Fi connectivity are significant strengths for the N7B550 and should not be overlooked. NZXT's ASRock built UEFI is clear and easy to navigate, so that makes overclocking pretty straightforward, especially when you get really good LLC options with a visual graph telling you what they're doing. Our first step was to knock the fabric clock up to its intended 1800 MHz, and this was straightforward. We could not maintain stability at our usual 4.7 GHz 5950X frequency with 1.35 volts and level 1 load line calibration, so we had to settle for 4.65 GHz. This is usually the point where I would complain about the lack of VRM temperature sensor data in the monitoring software. However, NZXT does not disappoint here. At first glance, it appears that there is no VRM sensor, but further investigation, including manual PCB and VRM area temperature checks that we conducted, indicate that the sensor labelled CPU underneath motherboard in HWM4 corresponds to the VRM temperature sensor. This is labelled CPU tin in HW monitor. Overclocking performance is, understandably, lacking on the N7B550 due to the competitor's ability to run the 5950X 50MHz higher. The margin is relatively small though. Idle wall power draws are a little high on NZXT's motherboard but the load numbers fall in line with the competition and are actually a little better under precision boost overdrive and manual overclocked loads due to slightly reduced frequencies for the N7B550 by comparison. The fact that this board is handling almost 360 watts of wall power, much of which heads to the CPU, is a positive outcome. Temperatures are all round very good on the NZXT N7B550. Sensible stock settings and good overclocked voltage accuracy mean that the CPU stays in check under a variety of operating frequencies and a 280mm Acertec AIO. And the big block of metal cooling NZXT's solid quality Vichy VRM components does a good job to maintain below 90 degrees Celsius operating temperatures even when pushing 359 watts of wall power in a high ambient test environment. We did not notice any detrimental cooling performance due to NZXT's use of an aesthetic cover. So solid job NZXT, solid job indeed. To summarize, the NZXT N7B550 is clearly a motherboard that's focused on form first and function second. And we see many examples of 
styling being more important than actual raw performance or usability. But if that's what you're after, a good looking motherboard that does offer generally pretty decent performance, even if some of the bits are um, somewhat quirky, then perhaps this could be uh, top of your list because it does look absolutely superb and unique in our opinion. We also like the inclusion of NZXT's own RGB headers. That's a really good addition if you're already inside the NZXT ecosystem. And then control through CAM in the OS is obviously as good as we expect. CAM is a really good piece of software and it does heighten the control abilities that you get in the UEFI, which are somewhat limiting. And in terms of cooling, number of fan headers, seven in total, absolutely superb. The locations are excellent, really good job there. It's also really promising to see solid focus on USB connectivity and high speed 10 gigabits per second USB connectivity at that. And the same can be said for two and a half gigabit Ethernet through the Realtek controller and Wi-Fi 6E capability. NZXT has gone big on networking connectivity here and that pays off in my opinion because it is very appealing to future-proof with that six gigahertz Wi-Fi connection. So clearly the main strengths are excellent build quality, good overall styling, especially with regards to cable management, ease, and then a strong, well-cooled power delivery solution. If we switch up to some of the weaknesses though, there are noticeable inclusions here. Firstly, not running at the correct Infinity Fabric clock when simply applying XMP is incredibly disappointing. Obviously this can be updated with a BIOS update, but it doesn't give me a high degree of confidence that such simple errors like this are getting through to release BIOSes. And then the M.2 system is just bad, quite frankly, it's really not good. The covers are cool, they look great, but functionally, they're not really very useful. They don't provide any heatsink capability. They block an M.2 SSD's own heatsink, so they're gonna be largely useless. And then even worse is the PCIe Gen 3 x 2 shared bandwidth connector at the bottom, which is really, really slow for even modest budget SSDs in today's market. The M.2 system is bad, quite frankly. And yes, NZXT pretty much has ASRock to blame here for the connectivity options, but they could have designed something better with regards to heatsink. And then otherwise, the lack of RGB lighting is pretty odd, quite frankly. Even if it's included and a user wants to turn it off, then yes, that will add to the budget, but this is already an expensive premium motherboard. Not sure why NZXT didn't include any onboard RGB lighting. It would look very good in my opinion. I think the notable point is NZXT's price point for the N7 B550. At £210, this is really expensive for a B550 motherboard of this class. It's really straddling the line between B550 and solid X570 offerings. It does have clearly some unique features which perhaps warrant the price point, especially if you're already in the NZXT ecosystem. However, at a very similar price point, you get the Gigabyte B550 Vision DP, which is fundamentally a better motherboard in terms of hardware. Most notably because you add Thunderbolt 3 on there, you get proper M.2 cooling and a proper M.2 connectivity system. You get better PCIe slot layout. So that's a fundamentally better motherboard. It looks quite similar in styling, but it is not as good, in my opinion, as the styling of this kind of armor design from NZXT. So if that really does appeal to you, and for example, if you're gonna use CAM and the proprietary RGB connectors, then perhaps the N7 B550 is worth your time and money. I guess with all of that said, we can say that NZXT has somewhat successfully delivered what they intended to. They wanted to make a stylish, good looking motherboard that is great for cable management, that integrates well inside their ecosystem, and they have done that. Yes, you pay a pretty penny for it, and yes, you have to accept some pretty fundamental shortfalls, but if this ticks your box, then fill your boots, I guess. Let us know what you think in the comment section down below though. Are some of these negatives a deal breaker or would you be happy to look at the strengths instead such as the glorious styling and the cool ecosystem through NZXT Cam? So I've been Luke Hill for Kick Group. Thank you for watching this video review of the NZXT N7 B550 motherboard. Like I say, let us know in the comment section down below what you think. If you want more information, head on over to the Kick Guru website. You can get more details there on the written page and that really supports us well. And then you can support us with a like, a subscribe, the bell icon on the YouTube channel. Visit our merch store and buy a cool t-shirt like this and support us on the other social media channels that we have. I'll see you in the next one.